is the Smart Buildings Academy podcast with Phil Zito, episode 411. Hey folks, Phil Zito here and welcome to episode 411 of the Smart Buildings Academy podcast. In this episode, we are going to continue our multi-part series on BAS project estimates. So in this, we're going to discuss how to perform a takeoff how to build a scope document, and how to identify scope items. We're also going to have a live question and answer, like always, towards the end of the episode. I do want to mention that everything we mention in this episode will be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 411. Once again, that is podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 411. Uh, so if you're listening to this and you want to see the video portion of it, it will be there. Uh, as always, use the chat to ask any questions. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. That really helps spread the show. And with that being said, let's dive in. The first thing I'm going to do here is I am going to go to share. I'm going to share part of my screen, and we are going to bring up this PDF here. Uh, so... This is going to be part teaching you what MEP documents are, part teaching you how to do scoping, uh, part teaching you how to do takeoff. There's going to be a little latency, as you can see, uh, from the actual uh, PDF, because this is a really big PDF. But uh, let's dive in. So first thing I'm going to do is kind of take you through a PDF layout if you're looking to go much more in depth, I encourage you to take our scoping and estimating course where we dive really deep into this. But uh, for today, we're going to kind of be 10,000 foot level. So on any set of MEP documents, right, you are going to see a lot of different information. Um, what you're going to see right on the right side, kind of who is doing this project, who's the engineer. You know, who's the architect, where's the location, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to see typically on the MEP set, you're going to see a set of abbreviations and mechanical notes. As I always tell everyone, the first thing I go to on any MEP set is I scroll all the way down here to what is called the equipment schedule. And at the equipment schedule, what I'm trying to do is figure out what items are going to be in scope for whatever project I'm scoping and estimating. So the first thing I'll do is I'll go in here and I'll start to look. Uh, usually I start from the bottom up. Some people start from the top down. What do I mean by that? I like to start at the terminal units um, or unitary systems. And then I like to work my way up to the big air handlers and the central utility plants. There's a reason behind that. As you get more experienced with doing estimates, you're going to start to be able to look at, you know, maybe you see 400 VAV boxes and you can quickly just eyeball the CFM. And then you look at the air handler and you're like, oh, that's a 10 ton air handler. And it's supposed to be doing 100,000 CFM for these VAV boxes. There is something missing here because that 10 ton air handler is not going to do 100,000 CFM. I know I'm throwing huge, crazy numbers out there. No one would make that blatant of a mistake. But at the same time, you know, those kind of accidents do happen in design. But when I look at this, I try to figure out what is this. Right, so I could see right off the bat, this is a VAV unit with silicone controlled rectifier heat. So what does that mean? It means I'm gonna need a VAV controller, but it's gonna have to have an AO to drive that SCR heat. Um, I see that there's 24 volts and I see that the heat is 460. I think that, that may be an eight. My eyes, I went to the eye doctor earlier today, so everything's still a little blurry to me. Um, 277, and I can't tell if that's 460 or 480. But uh, as I look through, right, it calls out the notes. This is where people start to lose money. 
So the first thing we notice, controls shall be provided by controls contractor and factory installed by terminal unit manufacturer. Controls transformer shall be provided by terminal unit manufacturer. Okay, so right off the bat, if you're going to order 25 controls transformers to do that step down, uh, that would be material costs that you did not need. So you want to kind of take a note of that. Also, what you're going to see, and I'm going to bring up, I, I don't know, can I, can I auto add? Okay, I can't go and stream two different things at a time. So we're going to have to switch between things. But uh, right off the bat, right, I can see that. I can see that if I send this to the terminal unit manufacturer, which I have to, um, I'm going to reduce my installed contractor costs. So my subcontractor cost is going to be reduced uh, as well as potentially my point to point um, setup and maybe a little bit of the checkout cost will be reduced. But we can see this stuff and I can get a pretty good picture of what's going on. Now what I need to do is to take this information and transfer it to a PDF. So I'm going to stop this and I'm going to bring up something a little different. And we're going to be hopping between uh, several screens today, just FYI. So I would go into this Excel sheet. This is just a basic generic Excel sheet that I created. And I would just say, you know, VAV is the system. What is it? It's a VAV, you know, with SCR heat. Uh, spec reference. I haven't grabbed the spec reference yet because we are just looking at the MEP, but I know the MEP reference is going to, and I realize you can't see this on the screen, but it's going to be M402. So I would go in here and you may be like, uh, this is a little silly, you know, going and doing this to this level of detail. But if you've got a large job, this is potentially like, Maybe you're doing a hundred uh, or a million dollar controls job or a two million dollar controls job. You may have two estimators working on this together. And if you're doing this in like Microsoft uh, SharePoint or OneDrive, you could be sharing and doing version management and you can start to build this out. You'll grab the SOP. This will typically be in the spec as well. And we'll grab our quantity. Uh, so we have 25 of these bad boys right here and they're all variable. So I'm going to grab my quantity and then under notes, I would just put um, send to to you manufacturer uh, for install to you manufacturer to provide uh, controls force XFR. That's short for transformers. So once I have that right, I have kind of a note built out here. And I move on to kind of my next system. So we're going to stop sharing this and we're going to go back to sharing the MEP set. There we go. So uh, it's loading up. There we go. I'll keep going through this air dirt separator. That's water. No expansion. Not really ours. Pump. Uh, chilled water pump. This will come back to us uh, in just a little bit, but we're going to see pumps with a VFD. So I already see kind of an RFI for me. If it's not clear in the spec, I want to see who's providing that variable frequency drive. Oh my gosh, stop doing that. Escape. No, it won't let me. There we go. Sometimes it creates those and then it won't get rid of them. All right. So like I said, provide pumps with a VFD and uh, that may be in our scope. So I'd want to RFI that. Okay, keep going along. We'll move over here. And we got a fan coil unit, right? Continuing that trend with unitary. We see we got a fan coil, it's chilled water, hot water. Nope, not hot water, electric heat, 2.5 kilowatts. Okay, 208. Basic system, it's a Daikin. Unit shall be provided with a modulating three-way valve. By who, we don't know. 
Uh, we'll take a look in a second at the one lines to see if maybe the one lines do a call out of who provides that valve. Sometimes while it's not in the equipment schedules, if there's one lines, it may be there. So I'll go and I'll grab this information and I'll add it to my sheet. I'm going to do this kind of off the screen because there's no reason to switch screens real quick. So I go fan coil, um, chilled water, and electric heat. Spec right, it's the same MEP reference. Uh, then quantity of one, who owns three-way valve? <clears throat> so I grab that. Uh, also, it says two-way, three-way control valves, and it says two-way here, but yet, you know, up here, uh, where was the note? It says, unit shall be provided with a modulating three-way valve, so kind of a little bit of conflict, but we'll figure out that. Move over. Um, we should have some exhaust fans in here. Yeah, we do, so I go to these exhaust fans, right? These all look like constant volume exhaust fans. They should be provided with a motor switch, flexible duct, a damper. We don't know who provides that, so we're going to take a note of that. Interlocked with the associating air handler unit serving the same zone. That's for note four. So you notice five, right, is not note four. So the MDF just from experience, we know is most likely going to be served by the fan coil unit, whereas these four rooms right here are most likely going to be served by the air handler. And we see that, right? Shall be interlocked with the air handler. Four, 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 four. So watch notes. Be careful with them because sometimes um, all the notes will not be applicable to all the items. So see some basic stuff in here. Fan shell. Be provided with the module fan mounted signal speed controller for controlling and balancing it. That really doesn't. Oh, yeah, of course. Install per manufacturer recommendations. Coordinate with controls contractor, which really this should be for coordinating with the test and balance folks who are going to tell you where to set the speed controller. But we see this is nine, and nine is not on any of these. Am I blind? Eight. That's an interesting note. So there is no note nine, even though, so that would be an RFI right off the bat. Uh, fan shall operate on a T-stat, coordinate with the controls and electrical contractor, right? That's T-stat, that's T-stat, set to 80 degrees. Are we monitoring these? That would be something I'd want to know if it's not in the spec. So basically, like the MEP set gives you kind of the skeleton and the spec says how we're going to lay the muscles and the skin on the skeleton. Go over here to our air handling unit, start to get pretty good idea of what this is, and we can start to build out that scope document as well, right? So we'll start to build this out. This has cooling coil and it has some preheat coil. This is electric as well. This is a York unit. And so we can see, do we have any special things to us right here? UV lighting kit. That's going to be interlocked with the door. So the lights turn off and the door opens. Chilled water coil. Provide with a filter. Nothing amazing. Unit shall be provided with a modulating three-way valve for bypass. So it's going to be three-way to bypass. So that's that's interesting, you know, that they're going to do three-ways on these even though they have a VSD on their pump. But, I, okay. Then we notice they have an air-cooled chiller here, and we're going to see that this is existing chiller three. Uh, and we have existing options connect to the backnet controller to the BMS. So we got a backnet interface. Now what I like to do once I've done this and I've got a pretty good site picture, I like to find the one lines. Now I will tell you that not all MEP sets have one lines and the ones that do have one lines, they're not all this detailed. Here's where I start getting the scope, but I'm going to take the scope uh, sequence of operations, rather. I'm going to take the sequence of operations 
and I'm going to put it in my document, but then I'm going to compare it to the specification to see if there's scope conflict. It's notorious for you to have a spec written by the engineer and have an MEP set written by the mechanical and have a scope or a sequence of operations. I want to say scope so badly. Sequence of operations mismatches, and you have to RFI that because if you don't, you'll have the engineer, um, potentially the commissioning agent, as well as the mechanical, all yelling at you, telling you you're doing the sequence of operations wrong because they have conflicting views of how it works. Once again, I like to try to start uh, where appropriate. So I typically will start at the VAV box. I'll I mean, you could argue you start at the exhaust fans, but I'll start at the VAV box. I like this one line. Don't get spoiled by this. Not a lot of people put actual AIAO on their one lines, but uh, just be aware. Terminal unit and damper actuator shall be shipped to the terminal unit manufacturer for mounting and wiring. So we already kind of figured this out. Typically, you're going to use a VMA, which is a uh, controller with a VAV actuator built into it. Uh, but we're seeing that there's a discharge air sensor that needs to be provided. And this is where you can start to build out your bill of materials. If there is a one line with this level of detail, you can start to build out uh, beyond your scope, which we'll talk about bill of materials in next episode. Um, not Friday's episode, but next Wednesday's episode. Uh, but right here, you can build out your bill of materials. And we can see we've got a wall sensor. With two AIs, I'm not quite sure why we have two AIs for these. I'd have to look at the spec because I don't see anything about humidity. I'm wondering if that AI is meant to be like some sort of adjust. I'm not sure what they're thinking with this. Uh, AAO, like I said, is D, it's um, DSR. Uh, it's SCR heat, which uh, silicone controlled rectifier uh, basically takes a zero to 10 signal and turns staged heat on and off. It takes uh, a digital uh, voltage signal and converts it into binary on and off commands. It's like a step uh, control, basically. So that right there, and you can see it's interlinked with DAT. DAT is not meant to control this. It's more so meant to give like a sanity check on if the heat is actually working. It's interesting that we have DAT, but then we have temp. So I wonder if this DAT, I, I'm not quite sure what is going on here. I'd RFI this. Like, why do you have an SAT and DAT? What technically SAT would be over here because that's the supply side. You know, I, I hate the term supply versus discharge air. It causes so much conflict. Uh, then you have AO, right? That's your motor drive and your AI. This is your flow. Pretty straightforward. Uh, a lot of these would not even be points you would add on your bill of materials. You got the same thing we expect to see for fans, right? We've got our fan BO. So we can already tell that all of these exhaust fans need to be controlled by the BAS. We see that we've got BOs that are going to fan start stop. So right off the bat, I could pretty much figure out that's going to be like a rib or an IDAC at the motor control panel, most likely, if not at the actual fan. See, we got a CSR for fan status, so just a current sensing relay. So that's going to be a BI. And then we've got an AI for temperature, because remember, some of these are controlled by temperature. Some of these do have dampers, so we're going to have some interlock logic. Uh, right, we got BO and BI. And then we can see moving kind of over to the fan coil unit. Right, we've got our... Heat, which is interesting for me that this is BO because the equipment schedule called it an SCR. So you would expect this to be an AO, not a BO. Um, but you see it right there nonetheless. I'm going to just real quickly check to see if we have any questions popping up on anything. Because sometimes the questions don't show up in the feed. So just give me one second here. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, cool, cool, we're good. All right, continuing right along, let me make sure our video is in 4K. Okay, cool, that's two. So uh, we got that pretty basic fan coil unit, right? Filter switch, fan start stop. We got our AO for our valve, got our temp. I don't see anything about a drip pan, but usually there's that on fan coils as well. 
with some sort of like condensate switch. And then we've got this, whatever this is, building pressure relief damper. So we've got a relief damper and we've got building pressure and we've got atmospheric pressure. That's kind of interesting that they're doing it this way. Typically your building pressure will sense building and um, that'll be typically your positive and then your negative will go um, to the atmosphere. If I'm remembering that correctly, it's been a while since I've wired one of those up i'm pretty sure building pressure goes negative and then ai is building just like on an air handler your positive is discharge and your negative tube is outside and then on suction your negative is the air handler and your positive is outside pretty sure i'm remembering that correctly it's like i said it's been a while so you can kind of see all of this stuff kind of just it gets a little crazy and then we'll go down uh james says it's a good point to start is a boq i'm not sure what boq means uh even down to the nuts and bolts valve flanges responsibility matrix yeah i mean this stuff can really add up pretty quickly and Kyle says exhaust fans are fun. I found that detailed schedules versus the cut sheets are routinely different. Yeah, they usually are. And it can affect pricing. You're absolutely right. Electrical details um, are often very confusing. Irons out. Bill of quantities. Okay. Okay. Bill of quantities. And I'm used to calling it a BOM, which is bill of materials. So yeah, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I agree. All right, so here we've got our chiller. And this is where things get really interesting because if I just looked at that equipment schedule, if I was like super fast, super aggressive sales guy who's got a golf you know, tournament in the afternoon, just joking, I love you salespeople. Um, but in all seriousness, if you're rushing through it and you're at the equipment schedule and you're like, oh, it's back in that interface, cool, done with this chiller. And then all of a sudden, you know, we come to this and we realize, oh, it's got a BO, BI, and AO. So I need to do start, stop, status, and temperature reset. I don't know why I have these hard wires when I have a backnet interface. Like, what's the point? But maybe redundancy, right? I've got temperatures though. So I got a return temperature, I got a supply, I've got a flow meter right? I've got all this stuff on here. I've got my chilled water pump with a BI, a BO, an AO, and a backnet interface, because why not? We're already doing backnet interfaces on everything else. And a temperature sensor. I don't see my pressure sensor in here to control this VFD. That's kind of odd to me, but you know, it is what it is. Take a look at this. We see kind of the sequence. I'm not going to go through the sequence because this isn't really a sequence class but uh, we can kind of see how they're doing it. All right. And we get to Mr. Air Handler. And Mr. Air Handler has a crap ton of stuff in it, right? Temperature, humidity, CO2. Uh, then we've got our different dampers, right? We can see those. We've got heat. We've got discharge. We've got a low temp freeze stat. We've got chilled water, fan. High static, low static, discharge air, and air, air pressure. So it says there's notes, provide a three-way valve, unless otherwise indicated on the schedule or in the sequence of operations. Um, like I said, I'm kind of surprised they're using a three-way valve on a variable system, but whatever. Uh, provide multi-position 120 motorized damper for proportional control of CO2 levels. Okay, so this must be you know, a decent size air handler to need 120 actuators instead of 24. But we kind of can see a lot of stuff. Then we get to go over to bleed my eyeballs dry land, which is affectionately the specification. I hate reading these. They're not fun. I don't enjoy it. But if you actually read it, you're going to find out a ton of information. So typically, the areas I focus on the most initially are part one general and part two materials. And then there's part three uh, scope, which we'll kind of hit at the end. 
part one general is like thou shalt do. And so it kind of gives a lot of basics. This is where you're going to expect to find related sections, integration, vendor exclusions, vendor requirements, uh, submittal requirements, etc. So right off the bat, you know, we see that we've got some additional systems, a computer room, air conditioning, and a lighting system, which conveniently were not on the mechanical set, or were they? If you did what I did, you could really miss it. It's super easy. Even I went and skimmed through this, right? And by skimming through it, I missed this little network diagram right here where we're, there was a lighting panel, power monitoring, and some other stuff, right? No crack unit, though. I don't see the crack unit. So very interesting. But we do see crack unit here, and we do see lighting control. So we've got crack unit that we got to do something with, provide hardware, software, and wiring to communication interfaces, right? Okay, hardware, software, that has like scope, blind spot written all over it. I would RFI the heck out of that because... I'm seeing this and I'm like, does this mean I'm supposed to provide all the Liebert site links or whatever Liebert's called these days? Can you see how old I am? Um, but uh, whoever bought them, I think someone bought them. So I got to find this stuff. Lighting control. What does that mean? Am I providing the lighting control? And then there's nothing right about power. There's miscellaneous alarm monitoring for ATS and leak but I didn't see that on any of the MEP set. And then there's domestic water heat. I didn't see that on the MEP set. So this is all stuff that, you know, it's important to read through. General product description. This is all pretty generic stuff. I tend to actually skip over it. Uh, products. This is where we find our related sections. Related sections is huge because it's a way you can get ambushed with scope uh, and it's a way people can exclude themselves from scope. So products furnished but not installed. Piping. Control valves. Now, when we read this, hydronic piping, you're not providing the piping. That's the category. You're providing the control valves for the piping. I want to be clear on that. I run into some folks that are like, what? We're supposed to provide piping, but we're in building automation. No, no, you're you're just doing... For hydronic piping, you're doing control valves, sensor wells and sockets, and flow meters. Does that mean you have to hot pipe, hot tap this into a pipe? No, because it's not installed under this section. So it's typically excluded from your scope. Under the refrigerant piping, you need to provide pressure and temperature sensor wells and sockets. You need to provide airflow stations, temperature controls. Products installed but not furnished, right? So we see that under refrigeration equipment, nothing. Rooftop equipment, we've got thermostats and duct pressure sensors. So that unit's going to come from York, JCI, and you're going to have to install thermostats and duct pressure sensors. And then integrated to but not furnished variable frequency drives and lighting. Saw power up there, but there's nothing related to power. And then we got some general conditions that could have additional work or a related section, sorry. We want to be aware of that. Approved contractors and the product line. Uh, this is important to know. Just because it says someone is approved and that's the person does not mean you can't go and potentially uh, do like an ad alternate or a like for like alternate. Uh, experiment, experience requirements, general stuff, right? Codes, general stuff. Then submittals. This is important. This tells you what you're supposed to do. Submittals are crazy important, not to the estimator, but to the project manager, because submittals typically represent the first bill you can submit to a project. And the quicker you submit bills and get paid on projects, the sooner you become cash flow positive, which means that that project is funding its expenses in lieu of overhead in the business unit funding the expenses. The idea for a pr project manager is to deliver on time, on budget, right? 
but also to go and generate cash flow as soon as possible without, you know, damaging the budget or, you know, messing with the timeline of the project. Gives us a bunch of stuff here. I'm not going to take you all through this. Tells us about warranty. This is important from an estimating perspective to give you an idea of what you may have to build in there for risk. And I'm just going to check real quick on, on LinkedIn, check a couple other places, just make sure that we're not getting any questions. Okay. All right, cool. We're looking good. So like I said, uh, potentially leak detection on refrigeration alarms, et cetera, maybe an RFI. I would RFI the crap out of this document. I don't believe these are CDs. I would be shocked if these are CDs. Um, so we've got products. This is where you're going to spend a lot of your time because you'll find some crazy stuff like in this document, it has crazy stuff, but you'll also really be able to get very tactical on your estimate. Um, while I don't necessarily say that every salesperson or estimator should get down into the weeds of like doing actuator selection, you should at least know like, oh, this is going to be an eight inch valve versus, you know, a two inch valve that is going to have significant cost ramifications if it's across a hundred units. So you want to get accurate in your estimates. Um, you know, it goes through and this is pretty standard. What is our supervisory level? What comm trunk do we use? Uh, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff because it's all just backnet stuff. And I'm going to move to skip over valves. You'll start to get like it'll detail out valves. This is pretty standard stuff. Most Belimos are going to meet this. So you're going to be good there. Bray valves are going to meet it. You're going to be good there, you know, if needed. But eventually, we'll start to get to our sensors. And this is where we have to start to understand, okay, so this is the air velocity sensor that they expect, and it shall deliver this kind of output and a range of zero to three. So we can already start to size our airflow sensors and our airflow measuring stations. We can already start to kind of figure those out. I mean, this one says it should be Ebtron Gold Series, so that's pretty easy for us from a selection perspective, right? A binary temperature devices, these are for those exhaust fans, right? And we see this. Uh, we see some aqua stats. And we get into our temperature sensors. This is where things get a little crazy. They call for 4 to 20 milliamp sensors that are platinum RTD. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the school's doing, but unless it's like a lab environment with like crazy precise requirements, I'm not quite sure why they wouldn't just use a 1K nickel um, RTD with, you know, 1K resistance. I mean, you're adding significant cost. And this is where you can get like slapped hard as an estimator if you're not paying attention. Because if you go estimate everything to be like 1K nickel and you've got platinum RTD, four to 20 milliamp sensor uh you got to have a power source potentially for that sensor it's four to 20 milliamp which means you're adding you know 30 to 70 dollars cost for each individual sensor who knows with inflation these days but uh these are areas where you could have big misses and then finally at the end you'll come to section three which is execution Right. And it's going to talk about exam. Like, how do you go and exam your stuff? How do you do site coordination? What is wiring? I mean, you know, basic NEC stuff, National Electric Code for those of you not in the US. Communication wiring, install of sensors. This is another area you can get smacked pretty hard, but it's not really for estimating. Uh, it's not going to get you too much unless you see something call out like, hey, everything needs to be in conduit. Um, then you could see a significant cost increase on your contractor side of things. Then we get to our uh, system demonstration. This is important. This is our commissioning. We want to understand what we're going to be expected to do so we can properly estimate commissioning labor. Training. We want to understand that so we can estimate training labor. And then sequence of operations. This is where... We're going to do a sanity check of the SOP here versus the SOP in the mechanical 
uh, drawings. And we're going to see if there's some conflict. Are there points missing? Is there something that's not potentially going to work? And we're going to RFI that. All right, folks. So there you have it. I know this went probably a little deeper than you were expecting. But uh, my hopes is that it gave you, in this short amount of time, a kind of understanding of all right, this is an MEP set. This is how we do takeoffs. We just count the things and then we look at the notes and then we validate our sequence of operations and our points that we built into a bill of materials list, which we'll do on next Wednesday. Uh, we validate that against our uh, sequence or sorry, sequence. Oh my gosh. I was saying scope earlier and now I'm saying sequence finally, but no, we're uh, validated against our spec. And then with all of this together, we're going to be able to build a scope of work, which we'll talk about not next Wednesday or the Wednesday after, but probably the Wednesday after that. That being said, I'll see what questions I have. I'm going to go check all the usual places and see if anyone sent me any questions. Let's see if there's anything I can answer for any of y'all. My hope is that this has been helpful for you and that you've learned from this. And uh, if there is anything I can do to make it more clear, do not hesitate to ask in the chat or after the fact. This will be up on the website in about an hour. Uh, we can always use you all sharing this. So just share it with your contacts on LinkedIn. Like and subscribe and hit the notification bell on YouTube or on Facebook or leave us a five-star review on iTunes or Spotify. And if you want like a really streamlined, detailed course on this topic, we do teach our scoping and estimating course, which will teach you in much greater detail how to do what I did. And it'll also provide a bunch of checklists and process documents for that. And then if you really want to get deep, we have our engineering course, which will teach you how to pick you know, different inputs, different valves, different actuators, et cetera. That being said, I don't see any questions from anyone else. I think we are good to go. So there you have it. All right, perfect. Well, thank you everybody for being here on this Wednesday. I am going to get back to work. And I appreciate y'all. If you have any questions after the fact, do not hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much and take care.